shields failing. Ejecting log door. What is all this about? And however did the Federation get to this point? In the real life year 1986, FASA Corporation published a supplement scenario to their very popular Star Trek role-playing game. The scenario was called Return to Axanar, with a companion supplement called The Four Years' War. The Four Years' War describes a first full-scale hot war between the Federation and the Klingon Empire, which occurs around the 2250s some ten years before the time of the original Star Trek series when Kirk captained the Enterprise. Now this is not to be confused with the Axanar fan film, which is a wholly separate story, nor is this an attempt at a Star Trek fan film either, but more of an analysis, review, and breakdown of the FASA version with some custom-made CG graphics for better storytelling. Although I'm a very big fan of the Axanar fan film, I feel I need to let everyone know that the concept of a war between the Federation and the Klingons before the time of Kirk is by no means an original idea. And the Axanar fan film will be called Axanar The Four Years' War. The FASA campaign was called Return to Axanar The Four Years' War. The creators of the fan film were not the first to tell this story. Star Trek Discovery was not the first to tell this story. FASA Corp was the first to take a crack at this story. And is told in the style and context environment of the original series of Star Trek. But canon by now in Star Trek is obviously a very fluid concept, and since this was written in 1986, there are many differences. The Klingons are less like honor-bound Vikings and more like brutal, conniving despots. Starfleet is still using lasers and accelerator cannons. Phasers and photon torpedoes are not used until the final months of this four years war. Okay, so now that you hopefully kind of understand the circumstances of this story, let's touch on something Picard had said in the Star Trek Next Generation episode first contact. Centuries ago, a disastrous contact the Klingon Empire led to decades of war. It was decided then that we would do surveillance before making contact. It was a controversial decision, but I believe it prevented more problems than it created. Now this episode was not written too long after the FASA content went out of print. I like to speculate that Picard was actually thinking of the planet Axanar and its relevance in the Four Years' War. Now, of course, technically, the war with the Klingons occurs a century earlier than Picard's era, but first contact with the Klingons occurs another 50 years or so prior to that. The first contact was a ship-to-ship -ship contact. From that point on, Starfleet had sporadic skirmishes, battles, and ongoing conflict for decades, but nothing accounting to a full-scale hot war involving the invasion of territory and the occupation of worlds. But just before Starfleet encounters the Klingons, before there was a prime directive, the planet Axanar was discovered. A cold, harsh planet with a pre-industrial, primitive civilization and large deposits of valuable minerals. In the mid-22nd century, the United Earth ship Bonaventure, commanded by Captain Hadrian H. Huckleby, landed on Axanar to study the planet and the civilization there. The initial contact party consisted of 14 members, casually opened up communications with Axanarians, whose initial contact with them was very violent. In spite of suffering casualties, the contact team was able to learn the Axanarian language. They were inducted into the Axanarian culture and regarded as the 14 gods. Some decades later, second contact occurred. The USS Yardley returned to Axanar to study the impact of Bonaventure's contact with the civilization. Except that this time an early version of the Prime Directive was in effect, albeit too late. Contact protocols were observed, and a seven-man away team was shuttled to the surface, disguised as Axanarian traitors. This was a disaster. Unknown to the OA team, a highly religious culture had developed there. They were asked by the first Axanarians encountered if they were of the 14. Not knowing how to respond to this, they should have said yes. But they said no, and all save one of the OA team was killed. It was customary to let one return to his tribe, so that it could be known that only those of the 14 were worthy of friendship. The 14 had become a sacred number that referred to the 14 gods, Bonaventure's first contact team. The Axanarian tendency to violent ritual led to conflict with outsiders. 
The Axenarians were a quarrelsome bunch, steeped in complex ritual and codes of warrior culture. Tell me, doesn't the nature of the Axenarians seem kind of familiar now? At this time, there had been no thorough study of Axenarian DNA, and if the scientists had been able to compare the DNA of certain other starfaring warrior species, the course of history may have taken a different turn, and I have no doubt Starfleet would have kept a much closer eye on the planet. Axanar was placed under quarantine as a protectorate sanctuary. They would return again some 50 years later to check on the Axanarian progress. Now during this time, contact had been made with the Klingons in a ship-to-ship -ship confrontation about 50 years before the Four Years' War, which began with the USS Sentry. The Sentry had recovered an alien shuttle. The occupant of the shuttle asked for asylum, and it isn't known whether the occupant of the shuttle was a Klingon, but it was more than likely an escaped Kuv, or a servitor race of the Klingons. The Klingons at this time were known to subjugate and employ or enslave what they considered to be inferior species. The pursuant Klingon warship arrived and demanded the surrender of the shuttle. Shots were exchanged between the Klingons and the Federation ship, but the battle was inconclusive, and the Klingon commander promised to return to wreak havoc on the people of the Federation. All of this indirectly confirms what Picard said, centuries ago. In his time, this would have coincided with the first contact with the Klingons, and when he says decades of war, this refers to skirmishes, plus the Cold War, and then a hot war with the Klingons. For decades, frequent bloody encounters with Klingon ships occurred, and then strangely, for a period of years, the Klingon frontier fell silent. Starfleet Intelligence would eventually learn that the Klingons were fighting a full-scale war against an unknown enemy on the front far away from the Federation. Feeling a sense of perhaps false security, Starfleet put more resources into exploration and diplomacy during this time. New ship classes such as the Anton, Larsen, and Loknar began production, as well as the infamous Constitution class. The Federation at this time had kept the Romulans in check, expanded through peaceful diplomatic outreach, and explored the galaxy without fear. Many in the Federation Council, such as the Andorians and the Tellarites, felt that the Federation had become dangerously stagnant, and it didn't matter that the Klingons were fighting a war on another front, they would eventually return to wreak havoc on the Federation. Little did Starfleet know that the Klingon Emperor, who in Fasilor controls the ruling houses, was being pressured to expand into Federation territory by the most powerful Klingon houses. Klingons tend to break down into civil war if not fighting some external enemy to unite them. And this was still true in the Fasa RPG universe. They deemed the Federation to be the weakest of their local adversaries. Their overall goal would be to annex a large part of Federation space, consolidate this, and then turn their attention to the Romulans. It is also important to note that years later, Federation scientists would learn that the Axenarians had many genetic markers that matched the Klingon DNA. Although it is never explained in detail, apparently the Klingon view was that they had ancient claims to many worlds outside their current empire, especially Axenar. The Klingons did not go back to their frequent skirmishes with the Federation. Instead, they maintained the illusion that they were too busy to commit their ships to the Federation border, while at the same time, they consolidated very large fleets. One task force was dispatched to Axanar, which would take a slow but stealthy flight path deep into Federation space, remain undetected, and establish a foothold in striking range of several vulnerable Federation targets. Meanwhile, on the Klingon border, the Klingons were up to what they had hoped to be a distraction that would take Starfleet attention away from Axanar. The USS Boar, while on standard patrol, detected a task force of three of the new D-7A Klingon cruisers moving along the border and poised to raid Federation space. The Boar decided to leave its normal patrol, which would soon take it near the Arcanus system, a location where the Federation maintained a large research outpost and followed the D-7s. This was apparently a Klingon tactic known as picket passing, for as soon as the boar was distracted, a fleet of 20 Klingon warships assaulted the Arcanus station. The Klingons were able to knock out the station's only shield generator, land marines, and capture it in short order. They proceeded to massacre every man and woman on the station, but kept it intact for their possible use later. Overall, 112 lives were lost. This was only the beginning. Later, the USS Rutherford detected a fleet of 100 Klingon ships moving towards Federation space near the Rigel sector. 
An almost identical force was detected by the USS Irwin, moving in the direction of Starbase 22. These fleet movements had caught the Federation off guard, as Starfleet Intelligence was convinced that their navy was deployed against the unknown threat on the other side of the Klingon Empire. Starfleet dispatched all available combat-capable ships to the Rigel Sector and Starbase 22. Of course, this was meager compared to the Klingon forces. But before crossing into Federation space, the Klingon fleets inexplicably reduced their speed from Warp 6 to Warp 3. This puzzled Starfleet intelligence because the Klingons suddenly were slowing what appeared to be a prelude to a full-scale invasion. Although the Arcanus slaughter was upsetting, and with much deliberation, the Federation Council decided there was not yet enough provocation for a formal declaration of war against the Klingons, especially given the vast superiority of the Klingon fleet. Several months passed while the Federation ramped up production of combat-capable ships. Meanwhile, the massive Klingon fleet split up into smaller task groups. Eventually, Starfleet felt it was time to check up on Axanar. The scout, USS Gulliver, commanded by Captain Sharir Thassal, visited the planet to see if the non-interference directive could finally be lifted. But before this could be done, they found something rather alarming in orbit, a small fleet of alien ships which the computer identified as Klingon. Specifically, eight D-4 light cruisers two D-16 destroyers, and one ship that was unrecognized, but Starfleet would later identify as a T-3A assault ship. This recording was taken from the USS Gulliver's recorded log buoy. The vessels are aware of Gulliver and proceeding to engage in combat. Formed into three groups. Enemy has tactical advantage and advanced weaponry. Shields failing. Ejecting log buoy. This log buoy was recovered by the cruiser USS Bonhomme Richard, who transmitted the log to the Starfleet Command, and then set course for Axanar. Meanwhile, the destroyer, USS Xenophon, commanded by Garth of Izar, was on standard patrol and spotted a lone D-4 cruiser heading towards the Axanar system at high warp. Garth knew that the Gulliver was supposed to be at Axanar and was long overdue to report in. He decided something was very wrong. Realizing that this D-4 cruiser may be connected, he decided to intercept the ship and ordered it to surrender. The Klingon replied with disruptors, but with good laser work, the Xenophon disabled the Klingon's warp drive, rendering it useless, and then was able to learn about the Klingon task force at Axanar. Garth headed for Axanar and arrived some days before the cruiser Bonholm Richard joined him. When word reached the Federation Council about the Axanar incursion, they drafted up a formal declaration of war, but gave the Klingons the opportunity to either totally surrender to Starfleet or leave Axanar under Starfleet escort. There was no reply. Garth was then given command of a small squadron of scouts and destroyers that would keep an eye on the Axanar system and intercept any vessels that tried to leave the system. Although the Klingons made no attempt to break out of Axanar, one of Izar's scouts detected a second fleet incoming. This one had several freighters and assault ships with it, clearly meant to reinforce and resupply the Klingon foothold on Axanar. Badly outnumbered and ill-prepared, Garth would prove his skill and resourcefulness. Garth sent some of his force into hiding, while the remainder was exposed to oncoming Klingons. The Klingons attacked and disabled several of his fleet's lightly armed scouts. Garth had secretly deployed a number of other ships, probably in conjunction with probes, to secretly mimic the transmissions and warp signatures of a large incoming fleet of Federation ships. This caused enough confusion to convince the Klingons to withdraw, but the hidden part of Garth's fleet then emerged and attacked the vulnerable sterns of the Klingon ships while they withdrew. the Klingon ships were destroyed or disabled. By the end of the battle, three of Garth's scouts were destroyed and most of the Federation ships were badly damaged, including Garth's own destroyer, the Xenophon. But this costly victory ended up being a very important one. Garth's actions prevented the Klingons from reinforcing and resupplying their base at Axanar, and would ultimately render this Klingon foothold useless. Garth would then be awarded the Medal of Valor and the honorary rank of Fleet Captain. 
This action alone, however, would not stop Klingon aggression. The Klingon Admiral, Kokoritsa, was unaware that the reinforcing squadron had been destroyed at Axanar. He transmitted in response to the Federation ultimatum, An alliance now exists between the powerful Klingon Empire and its honorable servitor, the natives of the world Axanar. By the insulting condition in the terms of your own weak infested council's ultimatum, a state of war is now in effect between the Klingon Empire and the United Federation of Planets. The giant fleets of the Klingon Navy then moved in the Federation space. And without revealing too much, as the rest of the war will be covered in part two of this series, despite of Gar's victory at Axanar, the war does not start well at all for the Federation. I want to thank you guys so much for sticking with me through this project. Once again, it seems like I've bitten off more than I can chew. But in spite of the doubts about whether I would complete this video, it seems the finished product was worth it. And although it may take a little while, I look forward to completing part two. And although my Patreon following is really small compared to other similar channels, I appreciate your support there. Those of you who don't like Patreon, feel free to support the channel through PayPal. The link is in the description below, and your support is what helps me to produce more and higher quality videos. Until next time, space friends. Since day one, something's been missing. I, I know it's time to transition to a new kind of way and let the passion come out. I'm a dreamer, dreamer. Time slows down. When I am singing my, my heart's true song Comes when I'm dreaming, I know what it takes I need my soul to scream out I'm a dreamer, dreamer I need to choose, need to decide Time to stand up, jump to the other side One way to go